someone needs to say the dark stuff and Schopenhauer has no censor. Welcome back to another Levity Books Review, my name is Liam and I hope you've been reading well. Today I wanted to talk about Arthur Schopenhauer, his text on the suffering of the world. This guy is probably the grumpiest man who ever lived and this is a foundational text in the philosophy of pessimism. That doesn't really sell it for most people but I really recommend people read this because these are the best arguments for disliking life. Essentially whoever you are you're gonna come across people who are just miserable sometimes. Maybe you yourself will be miserable sometimes and Arthur Schopenhauer has put on display the clearest arguments for why life sucks and I think by reading this it will help you empathize with people who aren't feeling so great with life but it also shows you that things could be worse because these are some pretty extreme views. For example on page 17 you could base a theory that the greatest wisdom consists in enjoying the present and making this enjoyment the goal of life because the present is all that is real and everything else merely imaginary. But you could just as well call this mode of life the greatest folly, for that which in a moment ceases to exist, which vanishes completely as a dream, cannot be worth any serious effort. On the Suffering of the World is the most commercially available text from Arthur Schopenhauer. It's also most accessible to a lay audience and essentially it's 130 pages or so, A5, we got like 13 chapters here and we've got essays and aphorisms but really the style is consistent throughout. These are all really aether aphorisms and what those are are just short quotes, like thoughts almost and all of them, I mean there's like 10 chapters and sections here but all of it's really about how it is difficult to enjoy life because death is permanent and inevitable. That's really what Arthur Schopenhauer takes head on in this book. Um, things that the realization of death makes unenjoyable. And while that sounds really gloomy and just like not worth your time and just useless, some of these thoughts are almost inadvertently useful in other areas of philosophy. For example, the quote on the front cover is a great argument for the ethics of, say, vegetarianism. Here's an example. It says, a quick test of the assertion that enjoyment outweighs pain in this world, or that they are at any rate balanced, would be to compare the feelings of an animal engaged in eating another with those of the animal being eaten. So it's less enjoyable to eat something than it is to be eaten. Therefore, pain seems to be the primary mode of existence for living. That's one of his arguments. So you might be wondering what made Arthur Schopenhauer write this book and who is it for? Now, Arthur Schopenhauer was a key German philosopher in the 19th century. He came before the existential philosophers. He kind of predates the proper existential philosophers, even though Kierkegaard was around the same time. Um, Nietzsche is essentially... He's, he takes a lot of uh, Schopenhauer's degree, uh, ideas and puts them in a wider context. But what Schopenhauer was doing was he was rallying against German the rise of German idealism, which I mentioned in my German video series of Kantian ethics, which is basically the idea that there is um, like an objective morality which can rationally say that some things are right and wrong. Schopenhauer's main argument is that most of our behavior comes from unconscious drives, instinct, from feelings. We, we do things out of emotional impulses and therefore we can't be fully rational. Man can't be fully rational. We can't have true free will because our feelings come from nowhere. We don't create them logically. It's kind of on the same plane as Rilke, as Hess, as Boll, as Durenmatt, and a few of the other people um, that I read in my German series in that he's, he's, he's vying against uh, German idealism but 
During his time, he was completely unknown. He was very unpopular. So Arthur Schopenhauer was to philosophy what Freud was to psychology, in my view, because both of them were arguing that because behavior comes from the unconscious, because we can't fully know who we are, because we, we, we act on emotional impulses that we don't create and can't predict, um, they were pessimistic about man's uh, fate in general, that we don't have full control over who we are, and a lot of people didn't like that, I mean, they didn't even like that too, but I think they were onto something, and there's this idea, this idea that we don't have full control of our actions because emotions aren't rational, is the reason why Schopenhauer is pessimistic. He thinks that we have no kind of control over our freedom and our actions in life, nor do we have control over our death. So he, he's pessimistic about those two things, free will in life and inevitability of death. And this is the best introduction to Arthur Schopenhauer, but hands down, because his other works, um, there's a lot of scattered essays, they're all brilliant, but they're very hard to find. And then those which are easier to find are too formal to be accessible to the public. I'm thinking of the world as will and representation, it's a massive book, and the basis of morality too, which is a formal critique about uh, against Kant, Kantian ethics, the other book being an outline of his whole idea of the world. This is just kind of his ideas about death, which are a lot shorter and kind of summarise a lot of his theories. Though I have read On the Freedom of the Will, his other essay, that's the first essay I read when I was 20. And that is really good at free will. Like it's, it gets across this idea so succinctly that, the, the paraphrasing the ending, it says, uh, "Man can do what he wills, but cannot will what he wills." And sure, that's a really powerful quote. That's I think changed a lot for me, and it really helped me even with neuroscience. I found that in a neuroscience paper. So, um, the idea that we we can tr control what we can see, but we can't see everything, is really the essence of Schopenhauer, Schopenhauer's philosophy. So many people, myself included, in their early 20s, they go through this dark phase where they start questioning the meaning of life. And I think it's normally triggered by like seeing someone get divorced or your grandparents dying or living alone for the first time or just or like a romantic breakup. One of these things, these like growing pains of becoming an adult. And a lot of people tend to read like Nietzsche or Camus or Sartre, they go straight to the existential philosophers, which I think is a shame because Schopenhauer, no one wrote more darkly, more succinctly as Schopenhauer. He really gets to the essence of the problems of life and what the meaning of life are. And he's like the deep end. This is the dark philosophy, but once you go there, you can only go up. Nietzsche is got so many references in his text that a lot of people go for him and then they just can't um, fully appreciate everything. Like normally it's just out of a normal reader's depth because he's normally referencing so many things where Schopenhauer doesn't reference anyone, He's got, well, except for some bits, but in, in here no references, it's just straight up observation, so it's very accessible. And it's kind of very important because a lot of people who write, like for writers, for example, like um, Jonathan Franzen's The Corrections, the uh, the dad in the family, is a lot of the quotes I recognize from this. Like they, Jonathan Franzen actually quotes Schopenhauer in The Corrections to show this uh, this kind of father of the family who's a little bit depressed. Like he's kind of. This is the miserable man archetype, is this book, basically. Rustin Cole from Drew Detective, a lot of his big ideas are from this book. So it's, it's kind of good to read just to see how bad things can get. And I know that doesn't sound so good, but trust me, once you read this, you'll feel more comfortable dealing with people who are a little miserable and you can also just see the, the the kind of it's almost a little funny at times just how um, melodramatic it can be um, and you kind of get it it's, it's not as uh, heavy as it sounds 
while I am giving this four stars, it's not without its criticisms. For example, uh, one of my friends used to always joke about Schopenhauer saying how Schopenhauer says life is all suffering and miserable, but in his life Schopenhauer was quite rich. He was, you know, bourgeois. He had his banquets. Apparently he spent most of his life just eating big banquets. And so the idea is, is that it's just bourgeois boredom, you know, he's, he's got such a comfy lifestyle and he thinks, oh, this can't be all there is to life. It's kind of, this could be the most sophisticated first world problems ever written. It's just, just in that sense, like also Schopenhauer doesn't have a great view on women and he had some it's short, it's, under, it's an understatement to say misadventures with women and that could feed into his views about women and also he's very very bitter about the fact that Hegel oh, was more popular than him at the same time and his philosophy was completely different to Schopenhauer uh, so there's a lot of personal resentment and bitterness in some of the forwards to his work which is kind of it's kind of funny. I mean, it also shows that he's human, but it also shows that he's quite temperamental. And so this could have been a coping mechanism in some ways. It's not to discredit the theoretical validity of his ideas, but it, it does suggest that they might be working from a very abstract area. They might be a little bit dramatic, you know? He might be, uh, he might be a little bit too... Um, a bit of a drama queen here, really. Um, so, yeah. But... Still, it doesn't mean that it's not worth reading because there are plenty of drama queens in the real world too. Alright, look, so there are plenty of more light-hearted, optimistic books about the inevitability of death. I'm thinking Tuesdays with Maury, I'm thinking The Last Lecture by Randy Pausch, but Schopenhauer is the complete opposite. He is the miserable kid. He is the deep end of the pool. The world is the pool. We need someone to say the dark stuff that no one else wants to say. But this is definitely underrated. Schopenhauer is strangely comforting and almost funny to read because he is so dramatic that he is almost a parody of the idea of complaining about life. By the time you read this, you'll almost feel better about whatever negative feelings you've ever had in life and also see the futility of trying to prove something like the world is just suffering. It's almost a parody, so whether or not you agree or you roll with this field of philosophy, I think everyone will get a lot out of reading this. Happy reading!